Well, believe it or not, after four months of bringing you weekly commentaries on Knight Rider's first season, we have finally reached the season finale, short notice. I'm so happy I feel like dancing. Okay, sure, let's go with that. Anyways, this will be our season finale as well, as we take a short break on our Nada Director's Cut series before we dig in to season two. Lots of exciting things happen in Knight Rider's sophomore year. New kit cars, new mechanic, and perhaps the best line ever spoken in the entire series. Michael Knight is a living, breathing insult to my existence. So whether you are hiding out at the Long Pine Motel facing a murder charge, or making a few bucks tending bar at the Little Nashville Club, sit back, relax, and leave it to us. This is our Not A Director's Cut of Short Notice. Production 57336, Short Notice. This episode was written and directed by Robert Foster, the executive producer. It originally aired on NBC Friday night, May 6, 1983 at 9 p.m. This was the season one finale of Knight Rider. It was filmed from March 8th through the 16th of 1983, and it was the 21st episode produced and the 21st episode to be aired. So let's dig in. We start with our first scene of the episode with Nicole Turner, played by Robin Curtis, leaving, uh, looks like Leonard's general store. So in reality, this is a restaurant in Canyon country, California. And let's take a look at it now. Here it is today. Still alive, still looking exactly the same. And for you, uh, folks who enjoy this, go through and and you'll see each one of these rocks matches up with the rest with the uh, general store we see in the episode. So it is the correct location. Nicole leaves the general store to see that her daughter Natalie is being taken by Natalie's father Harold T. Turner, and this this building is right beside the general store. So let's see if we can find it here, because I know some of you enjoy it. So we, if we go over here, and come down a little bit, there it is right there. That's the building that uh, Natalie was staying in right there. So it's all still intact if you guys want to go visit it one day. 12353 Sierra Highway, Canyon Country. Also take note, we've got yet another appearance of our Red Camaro right here off to the left. How about that? Jumping all the way ahead to the scene where Michael stops at night. Uh, he's already picked up Nicole and they're stopping at the Long Pine Motel to uh, hopefully get a room. This is in reality the Lake Sherwood picnic grounds out in um, Thousand Oaks, California, or it was in Thousand Oaks, California. We only know that because we have this. This is an original um, map that the studio used for, uh, they attached this to the scripts and the call sheets for all the people that need to be on set that day because this is one of the more obscure and out of the way um, locations. So they, they crafted together these, uh, these call sheets, these maps to uh, help people find where they're going. And that's the only reason we know it's Lake Sherwood Picnic Grounds on Carlisle Road, because if you look at this area today, it is completely changed and redeveloped and this building no longer exists. So um, there you go. But this is actually Lake Sherwood Picnic Grounds. Michael is chasing the uh, bikers 
and or the the one biker after shooting the other biker and we can see that this is that hard top stunt car and we can see that it's still got the 83 style seats inside of it and coming around this corner you kind of get a good look at the inside of this car so we just have at this point in the series it just has your factory 100% stock Trans Am interior, except instead of the Trans Am steering wheel, they put a smaller stunt wheel in. Otherwise, the interior is is pretty much stock at this point on this car. So as I was going through this episode, I made another discovery, and that discovery revolves around this police car right here, the Long Pine, Pine, Long Pine Sheriff's SUV. This is, in fact, the same SUV that has been popping up quite a bit in the series up to this point. We just saw it um, in Night Moves. We just saw it in the previous episode, Nobody Does It Better, as Armand's SUV. Um, we see it again in Big Iron. We saw it in the Topaz Connection. Um, all the same truck. And actually, if you zoom in real close, you can see the orange, the original orange color that we see way back in the Topaz connection. We see that here on the A-pillar. It's still, they still haven't painted that. You can also still see the orange in the, in the bed back here. So um, the next time we see this SUV in terms of production order, I believe, unless it, you know, there's another surprise waiting for us, is in the season two episode, Big Iron. Now, Big Iron aired as the season finale of season two, but in reality, it was one of the first episodes of season two to be filmed. So when you see it in um, Big Iron, it's still painted blue. A little bit's changed. The The door is, is now blue. The, the top is still white, but it's still this baby blue color. But um, yeah, we'll see this truck at least one more time. Maybe more, we'll see. Michael and Devin are leaving the police station after Michael's arrest for murder. And a couple things to note. First of all, here's that red Camaro yet again in the background, but also um, this building. So this is actually not a police station. This is the Saugus Elks Lodge in also in Canyon Country. In fact, this is about eight miles down the road from the the general store that we saw at the opening of the episode so if we look here and take note of the uh, stone um, feature on the side of this building and the barred windows here and if we go over and look at it now it's as you can see it's pretty much the same there's the stone wall the bars on the windows and it's lodge i can't 2879 maybe this is 1776 sierra highway in canyon country and kit was parked Right in this general area, I believe. And if you watched our last episode on uh, Nobody Does It Better, you'll know that we did a little segment on Devin's Mercedes and all its appearances. And of course, you know, we did that and now we see the corner of his Mercedes once again. This is all you see it in this episode is this tiny, um, on the, the corner of this one uh, scene. But technically, it's in this episode as well. And uh, we also see the corner of that Sheriff SUV on the left-hand side. Here are uh, Michael and Nicole at Nicole's father's house, Arthur Wexley's house. Um, this is another location that is still intact. This is uh, 1725 San Vicente Boulevard in Santa Monica. And we can see here, if you if you note the design, they're in the back of the house here. We've got a pool here. We've got this unique design here on the eaves. So if we look at it on Google Earth, there we can see it right there. Um, that's about as good as I can get. But um, this house is all still there and still intact today. So let's take a minute and talk about the wonderful Robin Curtis. I'm sure most of you are familiar with her work, not just here in Knight Rider, but in, in other shows as well. Um, she was born in New York and she's probably most famous for portraying the role of uh, the Vulcan Lieutenant Savick in Star Trek III and Star Trek IV. She took over that role from Kirstie Alley, who um, played it in Star Trek II. Uh, she also you know, had a number of appearances uh, in the 80s on, you know, very classic shows, MacGyver, Night Court, uh, Herman's Head, if you remember that show, The Equalizer. Um, she left acting and um, she is actually now a real estate broker in New York. So there you go. Robin Curtis as Nicole Turner. And while we're uh, talking about 
actors and actresses. This is William Smith, who played uh, hard guy Harold T. Turner. He's made a career of playing hard guys. Uh, still acting to this day, police story Barnaby Jones, uh, a TV series in the 70s called Rich Man, Poor Man that um, he's, he's pretty famous for. Um, you know, just lots of Vegas, uh, Buck Rogers, Hawaii Five-O, Dukes of Hazard, Fantasy Island, BJ and the Bear. I mean, he was all over the place. The Fall Guy, Chips. All right, I'll stop now. Um, but yeah, he is uh, still acting to this day. And one more, Sandy McPeak, who played uh, Arthur Wexley here, uh, known for Hunter, the A-Team, MacGyver, Dynasty, a whole bunch of different shows. He uh, quit acting. His last, his last role was in 1994, and he unfortunately died in 1997 at the age of 61. I don't know if you guys like seeing then and now shots of filming locations, but I'm going to keep showing them to you. So this is, uh, you know, Michael's trying to find a way out of uh, the little spat between Arthur and Nicole at Arthur's house and calls Kit. Kit comes speeding around this corner by himself and to pick Michael up. So we are at uh, San Vicente Boulevard in La Mesa. So if we want to look at this now, that's the intersection. So we come speeding around here and down this road. And then he pulls up right here to the gates and Michael comes running out. So if we go back to here and parks right here. And this is the gate to uh, Arthur Wexley's house. So there you go. And this motel where uh, Nicole is hiding out and Michael goes to meet her, this hotel um, was recently torn down, unfortunately, as recently as 2016. This one was at 7843 Lancashire Boulevard in North Hollywood. And uh, if we look at it now, this is what's there, an L.A. family housing building. But if we go back on... Um, google earth in their past we can see the building here so michael you see him driving up through here and nicole was in one of these um, motel units here and this is the building with all the the stairs that we see uh right here so unfortunately all gone and there's no way we could finish our season one episode commentaries without commenting on two special things one there is our gremlin one last appearance in season one red white stripes and also the lack of white wire right there still covered in gaff tape unfortunately for those of you fans of the white wire the ones that say it should have a star on the hollywood walk of fame or it should have its own facebook page unfortunately the white wire's time is coming to a close but i have one little surprise coming up shortly Stay tuned. Next up is Harold T. Turner's house. This is at 1440 Holt Avenue in Covina, California. Uh, unfortunately, this whole prop, um, this whole property was raised, and a new building, was, a new house was built on it. So it looks nothing like it did back then. This is the uh, entrance here, and if we go to look at the entrance now. Um, you know, this would have been where the speaker was and Kit was parked here, but this is has completely changed. And if we go back out here and we look at this house, it's uh, it's now a, a mini mansion that's been built here. So this is all new. Unfortunately, the house is, the original house is gone, but this is the property of where it was back in 1983. Here's Michael getting out. This is the backup to the hero car looking about as bad as it uh, ever will. So besides all of this gaffer's tape uh, covering the scene between the Knight Rider dash and the stock dash, um, we've also got, if you look right here, you've got the corner of, of the dash here covered in tape with tears and it just looks pretty nasty. And if we look up here, the overhead console, there's tape and it's falling down. But like I said a few minutes ago, we have a little surprise. There's the white wire on the back up to the hero car. Up until this point, we had been talking about it on the hero car. Here it is in the backup to the hero car. So a little treat for you uh, White Wire fans for the last episode of our series um, for this season. 
This is, of course, for those of you not familiar with the White Wire and haven't been following along with our, our series, uh, there was a running joke uh, starting early on in the series about this White Wire you could always see in the hero car. This is, in reality, the factory Trans Am uh, dome light wiring. So the wiring runs up this A-pillar across here and down the middle of the T-top bar to the, the where the dome light would be on a factory Trans Am. But here we see it on the back up to the hero car. Michael goes to leave and Harold's house, and this is the, still the backup to the hero car. We get to see a little bit different of an angle here, and we can make out a few details. We can still see the tape on the corner of the dash here. We can see it doesn't have any pods, which we already knew because we've covered this before. And we can see some of the stickers in here to represent the uh, LED arrays. We can see it does not have a lower console in here, which is... Um, Again, not meant to be seen up close on the interior. We move forward a scene and you kind of get a better look with the door open. We can see down here, it's a little blurry, but what we have here is a toggle switch and some red Dymo labels to um, control different things. Most likely this had to do with activating the line lock. That would be my guess. And this is Tiny. And Tiny in this episode was played by Dennis Berkeley. Dennis had a, a pretty a pretty cool career with a lot of uh, guest spots on a lot of uh, iconic shows like the Rockford Files, BJ and the Bear, um, Give Me a Break, Hill Street Blues, uh, Dukes of Hazard. We uh, met him many, many years ago. Actually, it was it was right before he passed away in 2013. And we got to meet him. It might have been 2012. And uh, just a real nice, genuine guy. And happy we had a chance to uh, speak with him and talk to him. As Michael is uh, driving away with, uh, you know, the uh, one of uh, Harold T. Turner's bad guys in the passenger seat, uh, we see Michael pretending to put the radio on. In reality, he's pressing the auto roof left button, and we can also see uh, we get a view of the tear gas button, which was only used once in Hearts of Stone, but it's still on here. But um, you know, Michael is planning to um, eject the biker out of the passenger side t-top so this whole sequence is a little weird he presses auto roof left and when he presses auto roof left eject right activates no one opens the t-top and the guy flies out so apparently kit knew what he was doing and then we get this great point of view shot of the inside of the car um, while they're approaching uh, Harold T who's shooting at them this is the hero car and this is this is kind of neat to see because we we've still got the Michael Chaffee style overhead console in it which we can see in some of the lights working and we can see the dash uh, working somewhat uh, some bulbs you know some LEDs around different things but notice it still has the original Michael Chaffee designed um, voice box in here, the square voice box with the, the rectangular auto normal pursuit lights. And that's because, um, you know, every time we see Kit talking, that's on a separate dash on a sound stage. So they never bothered updating, uh, this voice box. In fact, this voice box wouldn't be updated until partway through season two, whenever they do a refresh of the dashboard and Kit. So up until really the mid-season two, we still have the square voice box in the hero car. How about that? Here's a great turbo boost of kit over Harold T. Turner's Cadillac. And this is the Fliver car, for those of you um, not sure. And from this angle, it's really easy to see that it is the Fliver car, as opposed to a regular Trans Am. I mean, you can see you know, the dune buggy chassis underneath this shell here. And just look at this interior. This, you know, there is no A-pillar here. We've got the dune buggy roll cage here and then just this shell that's put on top of it. So moving forward a little bit, yeah, you can still see the uh, the gaps in here and the, the uh, plexi uh, acrylic front and rear windows. And then this point of view shot, you can see how far inset the the wheels are because the the wheelbase of this dune buggy was a lot smaller than a trans am so it wasn't as wide as the trans am and that's why you see this because this body was cast from a real trans am we return from after the commercial break and michael pulls up and skids to a stop back at the motel the one this is the backup to the hero car but the one thing i wanted to point out is something that you can't see here but it's the sound effect 
the sound effect that they use for the scene um, is a throwback really to to the turbine wind down sound effect that we heard from kit early on in season one um, it kind of went away in the second half of the first season but it's back for one last appearance if you will um, what, this is the last time we hear it uh, in the series but whenever kit stops at this um, motel so take a listen to it you'll recognize the uh the turbine wind down sound effect that i'm talking about and uh if you didn't realize it it's the same one we heard early in the series and this is the last time we hear it uh on kit again here we have gail fisher who played uh thelma arthur's uh, housekeeper in this episode uh, she didn't have a ton of uh acting credits but she did have a couple going back into 1960 uh, she was on a TV series in 1963 called The Doctors. She also made an appearance on Love American Style. She was um, a regular on the 19th, late 60s, early 70s TV show Mannix. Uh, also appeared in General Hospital and a few other uh, smaller productions. Uh, she died at age 65 in the year 2000. So here's a little treat for all of us fans. This scene right here is actually uh, unused footage from the filming of the opening intro. Uh, we can see we've got Kit racing at us towards the desert. They were obviously trying, uh, you know, different uh, moods and different times of day and different things to see what worked best. So this one was obviously filmed uh, right at dusk. This probably would have been filmed after the one, the, the take that we see used in the actual intro when the sun was, you know, still setting. This is, the, you know, it's just about to go completely dark and there's just a little bit of uh, sun, you know, daylight left in the sky. But this is the El Mirage Drake dry lake bed in California where the intro was filmed. And if we look over here to the right, this is the same mountain range that we can see during the title card of Knight Rider in the background. So there you go. How about that? Some uh, lost footage that they uh, decided to show us for short notice. We're now at the Little Nashville Bar. And uh, this is a special uh, cameo by series composer Don Peak right here, playing the guitar. This is the one and only time we see him in the entire series, but uh, there he is. And uh, he told us that um, he remembers filming this day, and he remembers uh, an executive from Universal, Richard Lindheim, came out that day and told them that they were renewed for a second season. And, um, you know, he, everyone was really excited whenever they, they heard that news, as you can imagine. So Mike was calling Kit on his comm link. Uh, if you'll notice throughout the first season, uh, Michael presses a button to contact Kit. And, uh, we see that go away in season two, where Michael just holds the comm link up to his wrist to call for Kit and not needing to press the button. So this is one of the last times we see him actually having to press a button to contact Kit. Back up to the hero car with the uh, the fake uh, seat in here, the fake blind drive seat. This is, I believe, one of the last times we're going to see this fake seat. In season two, they get a proper PMD seat, which we'll go over when we get there. And also for uh, this final episode of the first season, we get a couple more familiar cameos. We've got Jack Gill stunt coordinator and stunt man right here we've got this lady um the tanya walker look-alike who we saw in chariot of gold and a nice and decent little town she's back there and uh if we move forward a frame we've got harold hal frizzle who uh, was also on the crew that we've talked about in the past there so um you know just a happy little uh night rider crew party here at the little nashville club and one more uh, cameo appearance. Uh, this guy, who we saw in, way back in Good Day at White Rock, is one of the bikers. He's the one that gets the chain stuck around his neck whenever they're trying to uh, destroy Kit outside of the uh, White Rock General Store. So here he is making an appearance, coming out of the Little Nashville Bar. I'm assuming he's part of the Knight Rider crew. I don't know. Here we have uh, Brittany Wilson, who played Natalie. Uh, not too much is known about her. She only had four credits uh, to her name. Knight Rider was the third. Uh, she did an episode of The Twilight Zone in 1985, the, the new Twilight Zone. 
And after that, she disappeared. And so we don't know what happened to her, but she obviously left acting. So moving on, we are at uh, the Little Nashville Club once again. We can see the Satan Stompers patch here uh, from, apparently from Arizona. Uh, this building is still there, kind of. This is uh, 13350 Sherman Way in North Hollywood. And um, the Little Nashville Club, looking cool there, is now the Drunken Crab Tap Room. So... So you can see it still has the same address there. So the building is, this is the same building. It's just heavily, heavily renovated. Um, in fact, if we go back here, this this brick or this uh, concrete block building here is this same building right here. It's just repainted. So that's all still the same. This is a relatively new as well. Probably within the last five years, um, we could still identify the Little Nashville Club. It still looked like it on the outside, but now it's completely changed. And if we go back to our screenshots here, uh, moving forward, just one frame, it gets a little blurry, but we can see that this this uh, trailer here is one of the Comtron trailers, one of the Universal Studios uh, transportation trailers right there. Get a quick glimpse of that. And then it pans over to uh, to this guy on, on the phone. So in reality, that would be right about here or maybe over here but as you can see obviously the payphone is gone which is to be expected and now we move to this uh, abandoned ghost town where the climax of the episode happens this is in reality denver street i believe on universal studios backlot where they filmed a number of uh, classic you know movies and tv shows and and westerns and things like that uh, the virginian alias smith and jones um, Quincy and even uh, episodes of Airwolf and uh, Sliders in the 90s. So this has been used for a number of, of uh, different productions that required kind of an Old West town. We had the opportunity in 2011, I believe, uh, to go to Denver Street and, and uh, see it a little bit. It was, it was uh, pretty cool to be able to walk amongst these, uh, these uh, old-looking buildings on uh, the Universe Studios back lot. So Michael and uh, Nicole are holed up in this uh, general store in this ghost town, which is pretty well stocked for being an abandoned ghost town, I might add. But um, one cool thing to note is a lot of the props in here and these signs are all from the White Rock general store from Good Day at White Rock. Now, this is not the same building that they used. That building was uh, near uh, the Courthouse Square at Universal Studios. This one is on, uh, you know, is, is near Denver Street. So it is a different building, but a lot of these props are still the same. The Coleman containers, and like I said, these white signs with green accents and red and blue lettering, those were made for... Um, good day at White Rock and in fact not on these two signs you see here but on other signs um, especially ones that we see in Good Day at White Rock you can see that they actually w wrote White Rock on some of these signs so uh, they simply reuse this stuff from that episode which I thought was pretty cool and we advance ahead one slide and we can see another sign here the cold beer dollar 99 you can't see all of these signs in the White Rock general store um, because we only get views of a couple of the walls, but I'd be willing to bet these were mounted in that store, maybe on a different wall. Because, you know, when they were doing the set decoration, they didn't necessarily know um, exactly where the filming would be. So they probably decorated pretty much all of that store. So even down to these Hunts cans. So I, one thing I remember from Good Day at White Rock is they had a, an inordinate amount of these uh, Hunts tomato sauce cans. So you'll see them, they're stacked again here in short notice, but we saw them in Good Day at White Rock also. And what might be my favorite reference or throwback to Good Day at White Rock, the Nightcrawler sign right there. We can see this clearly in Good Day at White Rock and, and uh, Sherry, played by Anne Lockhart in that episode, um, even, you know, made note of, of the Nightcrawler. So I thought that was pretty cool. Moving over to Natalie being driven by Kit to safety. Um, not too much to note here. This is a kind of a cool, unique angle of the inside of Kit. Um, one thing that, that we do notice is they finally removed the CRT TVs in the hero car 
and replace them with with uh, LCD looking screens with the the updated frame. So, um, if you remember, the original car that Michael Chaffe delivered to Universal Studios had two five inch black and white CRT TVs in here with um, uh, unique frames around them. And those were all based on an old uh, Panasonic TV, even the frames were. So um, whenever they built the, the stage dash, the insert dash, the one that sat on a sound stage, and uh, they used it for all the close ups, they had put in uh, different TVs. They had put these square these square TVs in with a different style frame. And for the longest time, even all the way up through uh, Night Moves, and uh, actually through Nobody Does It Better, through the previous episode, the, the Hero Car still had those CRT TVs in here. But we can see now that they've updated the Hero Car to match the Insert Dash. So these these are no longer functional. You know, in the original Hero Car, the TVs were actually functional, but here they are not. This is just basically a gray piece of plastic to make it look like a TV. So they pr pretty much they added these these TVs. They upgraded this dash between the filming of Nobody Does It Better, um, which by the way that episode wrapped on. Um, March 4th of 1983. This episode started filming on March 8th of 1983. So it's safe to say March of 1983 is whenever the original Hero Car lost its CRTs and got replaced with this style, which more closely resembles the um, insert dash. So there you go. And we get yet another great view of the Hero Car. This one, the car's being towed here. So um, they don't have a blind drive seat in place. But a couple interesting details. Like I said before, we've still got the original Michael Chaffee style voice box here. Um, we can see we've the the buttons. A lot of the buttons, you know, had fallen off throughout season one. And and of course, this would normally be a turbo boost button, but it, that's for the insert dash. For the actual cars, it never really had a turbo boost button. So it's just a random mishmash of of whatever buttons here. Um, we can also see that the gear shifter button still has the Pontiac emblem on it. Um, you know, the, anytime we see a close-up of the shifter, that too is on uh, a soundstage and they have that blacked out. But on the actual cars, they still had the Pontiac logo on them. And we also get another look at that upgraded uh, monitor that uh, we just talked about a minute ago. And of course, the Michael Chaffee style overhead. For those of you who love this overhead, let's pour a glass and celebrate it because it's going away. Um, we do see it briefly in season two, kind of. But this is the last time we see it with the electronics working. So let's give a salute to Michael Chaffee's original overhead console. So now Kit's coming in for a turbo boost through a, uh, a fake wall here and a great point of view shot uh, where you can see the ramp. So we see there's a, a slight incline here and then it really ramps up here. And this is the other side of that. So we can see the fake wall here. This is the roll cage acrylic window jump car. We can see the roll cage inside there. And then Kit comes to a stop, and all of a sudden we are at that sixth hardtop stunt car, the one that they just received um, back in Chariot of Gold. So the reason I stopped it here is because this is a rare, pretty good close-up of that car. So we could see some details that we maybe couldn't see prior. So we still have the factory um, GM-style stick-on trim here. Again, this will be going away um, uh, pretty much start of season two, this goes away and it's replaced with a rivet on style. We can see that this car still has its rear defrost in place. That'll be going away also. Um, and it's a hard top car, but this is the first time we get a decent look at how they made the hard top cars look like T-top cars. They took pieces of metal and they riveted them to the roof. To make it look like seams for a t-top they did one in the front one in the back and one down the center to give it the appearance of t-tops whenever it's be, it's uh, driving by and also we get a look at the inside a little bit we can see we've got the 83 style seat here with the seat belt guide on the side and uh, round steering wheel right there 
moving to a different angle this is still that hardtop car and we can see here we've got the 83 style seat but then we have the the PMD uh, blind drive seat on the driver's side so a little mismatch mishmash there of seats but uh, who's counting right and then we move forward again and this is still the hardtop car we there you can see the squared off uh, 83 style seat the seat belt and the PMD seat and I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this because this is a goof that some people have picked up on. So this is the very uh, one of the last scenes of the the uh, episode, and Kit's being blind driven. But take a look at this scene while Kit's talking. Keep your eye on the seat in here. You will start to see the stunt driver lift the flap of the seat up over the top of the seat and start to get out of the seat they um, didn't cut this scene early enough so you can see kind of what happened after the scene was supposed to be done and you can start to see the guy get out of the seat it's hard to see on screenshots but um, this is his hand here and there's another hand right here so but if you watch the scene you can clearly see movement happening that's what's happening and also we get a kind of another look at those uh, metal strips so so if we look here you can see there's the one strip they riveted on and then the other one down the center. And that wraps up Short Notice and Season 1 in our Knotted Director's Cut series. We will be back next season where we'll start off our Season 2 with a bang. Goliath. Thanks for watching. See you next time. And now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. Look at you guys scrolling up the screen to my right. Wait a minute, how can you tell which side is my right since you can't see me because I'm not on camera? Oh well, you know what I mean. We are featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider history hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please, consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.